you would turn to the uh, book of Malachi. <clears throat> I doubt that we'll get through this, but we have to think about what we're going to cover next. Before we uh, enter, enter in that intense discussion, <laughs> let's uh, have a word of prayer. Father, we thank Thee for the study, for the word that Thou hast left us, that we may know Thy truth and the way to heaven. Pray that each of us would give an attentive ear to the things that are said and also be diligent in their study, personal study of thy word. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, when, well, one thing I think I said last week that uh, the only mention of the name Malachi is right here. There's some words that are very similar. Uh, it sort of has the idea of a, a messenger, but <clears throat> don't really know who this person is. And that's the case with a number of the, of the minor prophets, which also indicates that when it comes to the will of God, it does not have to be a famous person to uh, do his will to fulfill uh, the duties that are required of a Christian. Just make a famous person to do that. Anybody can do that. So that's <clears throat> in itself is sort of um, reinforces the idea that each of us can do our part for the Lord. Now, we don't, we don't uh, certainly, we're not prophets by any measure of the uh, imagination. <clears throat> I think I said, I maybe said last time that prophets were primarily uh, forth tellers. They, they proclaimed the word of God. And sometimes it included foretelling, foretelling future events. So that is not our obligation because the uh, word of God is now complete. It's, it's never going to change. And it's going to be there on the day of judgment. So we don't need to be forth tellers or foretellers. We need to be retellers. I'm not talking about selling stuff. I'm talking about telling it again and again. We need to be retellers. Tellers. <clears throat> and the time that we, this was written, best that people or scholars can determine is probably a little bit before 400 B.C. You know, there's this uh, period of silence between the Testaments, this 400 year of silence. Malachi was the last book to be written. It's thought it's written sometime a little bit before 400 B.C., which would uh, be contemporary with Zach Rye and some others. So, <clears throat> But the problem in... Uh, uh, that Malachi is addressing is that the uh, the people had become indifferent to both the moral and ceremonial aspects of the uh, of the law of the divine law, and that was the divine law was what was supposed to characterize the people, but they had gotten away from it. The exiles had been back for quite some time, and and they should have learned the lesson now. They, they didn't get off in idolatry again like they did before. But uh, they weren't really serious about uh, their worship or their uh, compliance with the law of heaven. <clears throat> and the people could say that <clears throat> you know, the blessings that they were promised they had not received, which they hadn't. And the reason being is that the blessings, and of course, and I have said again that curses also, but the blessings are conditional. The Lord has specified that you are to do this, this, and this, and they didn't. And He, well, he promised that they would uh, receive, of course, material blessings, which they didn't. So they uh, were saying that 
it doesn't do any good to obey God because you don't get any blessings anyway. The fact of the matter is, they hadn't obeyed God. And we must always remember that uh, when God promises something, He delivers. God will always do His part, and He always will fulfill His... Um, well, as it says here in Malachi, a number of times it says commandments, which is the uh, punishments. He will always fulfill those commandments also if one does not obey. And I said here in uh, uh, the first part of Malachi, it says the, the burden of the word of Malachi, and that word is used... Uh, in a few places, and it's the uh, the obligation or the punishment that is going to be in, imposed by by uh, Lord on Israel. <clears throat> and I said that uh, this uh, the style of teaching here is the uh, didactic dialectic uh, method, and I said the best way. To to see how that is, how that operates, you can go on YouTube and uh, type in Yeshiva school, which is the uh, Jewish schools. There's Orthodox schools and there's uh, not a Orthodox schools, but <clears throat> they're called Yeshivas. And the way that they, the primary way they do in uh, instruction is they have a Shavrusa which is a partner, and they be they have tables just like we have folding tables back there, and they'd be uh, students and partners at the table, reading the the primary, the Torah, and the uh, oh, what's the other book? Uh, whatever it is. <laughs> but they would uh, be reading that, and the uh, Shavrusa would uh, pose a question, and the student would answer it, and they'd argue over it. And there'd be a whole room like this one, quite a few tables. And uh, every one of them filled up with uh, uh, students in Chavarusas. And it was very noisy. So you learn to concentrate on just your table. But the, uh, this dialectic didactic uh, involved asking questions and then trying to answer those questions. And that's what we have here. <clears throat> and it says here in verse uh, 2, I have loved you, says the Lord. And here's where the Chavarus comes in. He <laughs> said, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? <clears throat> and here's the, uh, the answer to it. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Uh, now, now, we're not really talking about the individuals. You know, Jacob was Esau's brother, but we're really talking about the two nations, Edom and uh, Israel. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob have I, lo I have loved, but Esau I have hated. <coughs> and laid waste his mountain and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Now let's think about this a moment. Uh, I, I have no doubt that Jacob, uh, I went to, uh, Isaiah loved, not Isaiah, Isaac loved both of them. I have no doubt that he loved both of them. So we're not talking about the individuals, we're talking about the nations. Now what characterized these two nations? Well, Jacob was going to be the father of the uh, chosen people, whereas Esau was an evil. The nation itself was evil. So God rejected Esau, or Edom, if you want to call it that, and, uh, but blessed Jacob. Now, these people knew this. They knew, they knew their history. They knew that happened. And they knew that they were blessed and Jacob, I mean, Esau was cursed. 
So that's how the Lord had uh, loved uh, Jacob and hated Esau. In verse 4, even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. And no, they wouldn't. Thus said the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will throw down. So they're going to be defeated, I think, when we uh, covered one of the uh, minor prophets. We said that Edom had been conquered by the uh, Chaldeans, and then they had been conquered by the Nabataeans and by the Maccabees and by the Romans, and they were completely destroyed. They were absorbed by other peoples, so they no longer existed as a separate people. But he says uh, in the latter part of verse 4, They may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness. And the people against whom the Lord will have that indignation forever. And that indignation resulted in their um, total destruction. They, they, they're just gone. <clears throat> In verse 5, your eyes shall see and you shall say, the Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. When the world considers these things, they will see that God, in fact, has blessed Jacob and has cursed Esau or Edom. <clears throat> so the eyes of the world are going to recognize what's taking place. In verse uh, 6, we, uh, he talks about the uh, rebuke of the uh, priest. He says, A son, verse 6, a, a son honors his father and a servant his master. Now, this honoring a father, the, you know, you go back to the Old Testament uh, in Exodus, the 21st chapter, verses uh, 15 and 17. <coughs> You see there, if a, a child strikes his parents, or he's doing one or the other, or he uh, curses his parents, one or the other, or both, you know, as the case may be, that uh, child was put to death. <clears throat> so it was very, uh, very strong, uh, I guess, impulse in the uh, Jewish world there to honor fathers and mothers. <clears throat> Because severe consequences for not doing so. And of course, we know that, you know, servants honored the master. Most of the uh, people in that time were slaves, so they had a master and they honored the master. Uh, they better honor the master. <laughs> It'd be uh, dire results if they didn't. <clears throat> so these people, they were, they knew this, they were accustomed to this. So he says, if then I am the father, and he is, where is my honor? Have you honored me? If I am a master and you're the servant, which he is and you are, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts. And I might add that you'll see this, says the Lord of hosts, all throughout here, so that uh, gives uh, credibility to what's being said as you know, the source. To you, priest who despise my name, yet you say, in what way have, your, have, you, uh, have we despised your name? Well, they're certainly thinking about just one aspect of uh, despising, you know, I guess going up and spit in their face or uh, I can go up to Buddy and tell him that his your wife is ugly, but that, you know, we know that's not true. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. <laughs> it can be a lie. It's okay. <laughs> but that's uh, showing disrespect. That's despising. He said, you offer, well, how, okay, how do, how do you uh, uh, despise your name? You offer defiled food on my altar these are the sacrifices they were the required sacrifices you offer defiled food on my altar but you say 
in what way have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible, they didn't have the proper respect for the table of the Lord and what they were supposed to do there. Well, how did they do that? <clears throat> how did they make the uh, table of the Lord contemptible? When you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? Yes, it's evil. You know, they were supposed to offer the, the best of the flock, but they weren't doing it. <clears throat> when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? Well, yes, it's evil. And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Yes, it's evil. Okay, you, you want to do that? You want to do that to, to your Father in Heaven? Okay, fine. <clears throat> Why don't you offer it to your governor? Offer it then to your governor. Will he be pleased with you? Would he, he accept you favorably? No, he wouldn't. He says, says the Lord of hosts. But now entreat God's favor, and they hadn't done it. They had not done that. <clears throat> that he may be gracious to us. And God is very forgiving, and so if they were to entreat him, he is uh, gracious enough to forgive them. Now, but now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done by your hands, Will he accept you favorably, doing those things that uh, they wouldn't even do to their governor? No. It says the Lord of hosts again. <clears throat> who is there among you who would shut the doors that you, so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. Who uh, have you... <clears throat> Is brave enough to shut the doors to the uh, where the the animals are sacrificed, and we're talking about blind animals and sick animals and what have you. Those that are not were not supposed to be sacrificed. Which one of you is brave enough to go in there and say, "No, you're not going to do it. You're not going to offer something uh, that's disrespectful to the Lord." Nobody was brave enough. <clears throat> He says, I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> Nor will I accept an offering from your hands from the rising of the sun even to its going down. So it's, it's going to be uh, all the time. He's not going to be, be uh, accepting any uh, offering from them. Now, they may be actually offering things, but he's not going to accept it. My name shall be great among the Gentiles. <clears throat> And we have to be talking about the uh, Messianic age here because there's no indication at this time that the uh, Gentiles had any regard from at all. In every place incense, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering of those things, the righteous offerings, those things that were commanded to be uh, done. <clears throat> For my name... Uh, shall be great among the nations. And again, we're talking about the Messianic age because, uh, you know, this at this time, they were not great among the nations. They were a very small nation and very insignificant. In verse 12, it says, <clears throat> but you profane it. That's the things that they were supposed to offer in worship. You profane it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and his fruit, his food is contemptible. <clears throat> well, it was defiled by their acts. That's how it was defiled. <clears throat> but they were saying that, that uh, you know, somebody else's fault. <clears throat> you also say, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. So, so worship had become a burden to them, and they were doing just the absolute necessary, absolutely necessary, to get through it, because they wanted to be out of there, which we're going to be out of here in just a second. <clears throat> so they sneered at it, uh, said, "You bring the stolen, 
the lame and the uh, sick. So they were stealing animals for the sacrifice too. Thus you bring an offering. Well, that offering is not going to be accepted. Should I accept this from your hand? No, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to accept it. Verse 14, but cursed be the deceiver. That, that's the dishonest person who has a has in his flock a male and makes a vow. And remember, these vows are voluntary. Nobody forces them to make a vow. <clears throat> but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. So he makes a vow voluntary. Then to satisfy the vow, he offers something that's blemished. He says, for I am a great king. We're well, great kings. I'm not going to tolerate stuff like that, says the Lord of hosts. And my name is to be feared among the nations. Now, the fact remains that if the Jews do not fear God, how do they expect the Gentiles to fear God? Well, they're not. <clears throat> and uh, we'll take this up next time. One thing we need to think about is uh, what we're going to start on after this one. <clears throat>